Grace and peace be to you from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. The text this morning for our consideration taken from John's Gospel. We read from the first chapter, beginning with the 35th verse. The next day John was there again with two of his disciples. When he saw John, Jesus passing by, he said, Look, the Lamb of God. When the two disciples heard him say this, they followed Jesus. Turning around, Jesus saw them following and asked, What do you want? They said, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? Come, he replied, and you will see. So they went and they saw where he was staying and spent that day with him. It was about the tenth hour. Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, was one of the two who heard what John had said and who had followed Jesus. The first thing Andrew did was to find his brother Simon and tell him, We have found the Messiah, and that is the Christ. And he, and he brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, You are Simon, son of John. You will be called Cephas, which is translated Peter. The next day, Jesus decided to leave for Galilee. Finding Philip, he said to him, Follow me. Philip, like Andrew and Peter, was from the town of Bethsaida. Philip found Nathanael and told him, We have found the one Moses wrote about in the law and about whom the, the prophets also wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nazareth? Can anything good come from there? Nathanael asked. Come and see, said Philip. When Jesus saw Nathanael approaching, he said to him, Here is a true Israelite in whom there is nothing false. How do you know me? Nathanael asked. Jesus answered, I saw you while you were still under the fig tree before Philip called you. Then Nathanael declared, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. Jesus said, You believe because I told you I saw you under the fig tree. You shall see greater things than that. Then he added, I tell you the truth. You shall see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. This is God's word. Dear friends in Christ, I always think it's somewhat fascinating to think back in one's life when the first time you recognize Jesus through the waters of holy baptism. Benaiah has been clothed with the Holy Spirit and has been given the name of Christ, his Lord and Savior. As he grows, I'm very confident his parents and his family and his grandparents will tell him a lot about Jesus. And what a wonderful thing that is. As we think about that, though, it is through the ordinary everyday occurrences that sometimes God works his greatest miracles. I'm not speaking of baptism here, I'm speaking of just ordinary things. Maybe there is one person here today that the only reason in the world you're here is because you want to recognize and honor the family because of a baptism. But you have come to see Jesus. You have heard his word. You have heard his promises that have been made to you and to all people and all believers. The kingdom of heaven grows not by just monumental 3,000 member crowds at Pentecost, but by the individual souls, the victory that is found in the individual heart. And so often that comes from a parent or a grandparent or a friend or a family member that encourages someone in their Savior, Jesus Christ. I'm fascinated by the evangelism plan of Jesus. Two of John the Baptist's followers, after John the Baptist had said, look, the Lamb of God takes away the sin of the world, began to follow Jesus. And so what do we do? Put into work Evangelism 101 here and start working out plans and methods and strategies for Jesus to reach out? No, he just says, what do you want? It's a key question in life, especially in our faith life. Jesus knew precisely what they wanted. It was not for him to gather information about these two individuals. He knew exactly what they were after and what they were interested in. And so the question wasn't meant for Jesus, it was meant for them. And so I ask you here this morning, why are you here? What do you want? I 
I am not going to rattle off all kinds of things that our congregation can offer to you and that we can do for you and this and that. But what is in your heart? Are you looking for Jesus? Nah, don't, don't need him. Don't need that. Everything is going fine. What is it? You never have any problems. You never have any concerns. You get along famously with all of your family members and all your friends and all your co-workers. You don't get angry with anyone. You aren't jealous of anyone else's good fortune. And you aren't the least bit afraid of what would happen if you died. No one escapes those questions. And that's why we come to our Lord, because we have all kinds of questions. How do I deal with a heart that's hurting? I've lost a loved one. I don't know how to go on. Family and friends, they're there for me, but as the weeks go on, there's less. And the months go on, there's less. I'm perplexed about this situation in my family. I can't get along with my children. They seem to detest me. They want nothing to do with me. What do I do? I suppose we could go into self-help books and we could ask our friends and they'll say, yeah, same thing with me. And a lot of good that does. Or we could bring our concern to the Lord. I don't know why bad things always seem to happen to me. Why do I always have such rotten luck? I suppose I could try to diagnose the problem and figure it out. Or else I could come to Jesus. So Jesus looks at those two. What is it you are seeking? And I'm sure the question, if had he pressed it, would have been, are you the one? Are you the Messiah? Are you the one that has been sent to save people from their sins? And Jesus would have been quick to say, come and see. That's who I am. That's why I came. And so he addresses these two disciples. John never identifies himself, but it's probably pretty obvious that John was one of those two. And the other one was Andrew. And after hearing the Lord, what does Andrew do? He runs after Peter, his brother. We found him. We found him. Come and see. And Peter comes. Now we don't deal with everyone the same way as our Lord shows us. And so the Lord says, Peter, who was called Simon at that time. Simon, your name is no longer going to be Simon. It's going to be Cephas. Peter, there's going to be a whole change in your life. A whole different direction. As they go on, Jesus meets Philip in the street. He says, follow me. Just that. Follow me. Philip's so excited, he runs off, he tells Nathaniel, we found him, we found him. Come on, see. Where's he from? Nazareth. Nazareth? Do you know what kind of people live in Nazareth? Come and see. And Nathaniel came. And how does the Lord address him? I saw you sitting underneath the fig tree before Philip came. How do you know that? You are the Lord. You are the Son of God. I appreciate how the Lord just always brings everything back to himself and to what he had come to do for them and for their salvation. And that's why all of us are here today. We want to hear again what Jesus has done for us. We never tire of hearing that he died on the cross to pay for all of our sins. We never tire of knowing that he loves us with an everlasting love that goes beyond anything we can imagine, beyond, beyond any family tie. It's a love that is eternal. He loves us in spite of ourselves at times. He loves us when we are very much unlovable. But he does that. And the more we learn of that, the more we appreciate what he has done for us and for our salvation, the concerns that we are going to come with him, to him with, aren't, aren't as important. 
Maybe I never had that perfect relationship with, with my family members and everything. But I know my Lord, and I know that He can work miracles. And He can take a situation that's bad, He can make it good. I know that I'm stressed out over everything, and I'm going to go back to work tomorrow, and that stress is going to be right there again. But somehow, some way, knowing my Savior's love, takes my eyes off that stress a little bit, and focuses it on Him. It makes me realize that this is but for a day. What the Lord has given me is for eternity. As the Lord was calling his disciples in a unique manner of an evangelism program, if you will, only he could come up with, when we look at the individual Andrew, you have to love Andrew. All we hear about Andrew in scripture is that he keeps on bringing people to Jesus. He is not of the stature of Peter or Paul or John. He was Andrew. Andrew was, you know, just Andrew. Nothing special. But when a lad had a couple loaves of bread and a couple fish and the people were all gathered to hear Jesus, 5,000 strong of them, it's Andrew who brings this lad to Jesus. Hey, he's got some food. When the Greeks wanted, wanted to see Jesus, it was Andrew who brought those Greeks to see Jesus. And now when Peter, who probably didn't want to see Jesus, Andrew came to him and said, come on along, I want you to see Jesus. Who's there in your life that you can ask if they would come with you to see Jesus? Who's there in your life that you can tell about Jesus, that you can tell what Jesus has done for them and for their salvation? It's possible that the Bible never would have had a Peter if it weren't for Andrew. You know, we think of, um, oh, he's a pastor. He gets to stand up in front of people and he preaches all wonderful. If we took away all your shining lights, this would be a dark world if you're only left for pastor. What pastor does pales in comparison to what you do. You have access to your homes, your friends, your neighbors, your co-workers. There are no insignificant workers. And though you will never have your name perhaps highlighted or never have special recognition, you'll go on in life and you'll go to work every day and you'll provide for your family and you'll take care of the family's needs and, and you will be there to, to love your children. That doesn't make the news, does it? But it does not escape our Lord's attention. And because of what you do, we have people that continue to strengthen the body of believers, Christ Church here on earth. And the work you do is not insignificant. And you don't have to have a course in theology and go through all the dogmatics classes to be able to understand all the doctrines of Scripture. All you need to know is Jesus loved me, he died for me, and he died for you. Because see, when it comes to reaching out, we first of all have to be convinced of it ourselves. We have to believe in our hearts that Jesus did die for me. I can never be a faithful witness for my Lord. I can never encourage someone in the Lord if I first didn't believe it myself. I'd be a fraud. I'd do more damage for the kingdom work. And so we come to know our Lord. We come to taste his love. And people will say, well, what did you do Sunday morning? Well, we were at church and we had a baptism. What's that? I mean, that's where you take some water and put it on a person and then magic things happen. Never, ever underestimate the power of God's word. The power that said, let there be light, and there was light, and let there be darkness, and there was, let there be the seas, and everything, and the power in that word. The power in that word when the disciples are going across the lake, and a storm is raging, and Jesus just says, peace, be still. And the waters died down, they were like glass. And so God attaches to this water his promise. And it's a very 
big deal. Something tremendous, a miracle happened here this morning, and we were able to witness it. We were able to witness the miracle of new life in Christ. What a blessing that is. And I would venture to say that if you told someone about that, it might pique some interest. And you'd be doing what Andrew did. You'd be doing what Philip did. Sometimes we way overthink ourselves and make this so complicated about how, how do I witness my faith. You witness your faith by living it. You become a daily witness of it. You witness the joy of the salvation that you have in your hearts and the opportunity to share that with someone else. The kingdom of God grows one soul at a time. And the Lord, on so many occasions, went very much out of his way for just one person. He preached to many, of course, but that individual love that he had. It is as though Jesus wants us to know that right now you are the only one in the world that I love you with an everlasting love because you are my precious child. I have others, of course. But he wants to know how dear you are to him. So, why are we here? The Lord says, come and see. Come and see all that I've done. And let the Holy Spirit continue to fill your hearts. That love and that certainty of faith. So that you live that faith. And remember, there are no ordinary people in the Lord's kingdom. There are only extraordinary witnesses for our Lord. And God grant that you might be that Philip, or that Andrew, or you, who tells someone, come and see, and bring them to see their Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.